Hey, welcome back to our Sky Tonight program. My name is Seth Mayo, Curator of Astronomy for the Loman Planetarium. And in this episode, we're covering the dates of June 7th through June 13th. We're going to kick things off by talking about the winter stars of Gemini beginning to set in the west. And then we'll look over to the east and watch some summertime stars begin to rise higher and higher in the evening. We'll then talk about the June 10th annular eclipse, especially for those who are in more northern parts of the world. And we'll end things by talking about the moon getting fairly close to the planet Mars in the evening. So let's get to it. At this time of the year, we can start to say farewell to the famous winter constellation, the Gemini Twins. And if you're looking towards the west just after sunset, not high above the horizon, you may find the stars of Gemini lingering in this area. And even though Gemini is a winter constellation, it's one of the last ones you can see at this time of the year, even though we're close to the summertime. It's very low in the sky, so it is making it challenging to see, especially if you have any obstacles in your way, like trees, buildings, that may obscure your view of the twins as they set below the western horizon. In this area, you still may notice these two bright stars here. This is Pollux, and this one is Castor, and those are the heads of the twins. If we draw the twins with the constellation lines, they look like these two stick figure shapes sort of holding hands in the sky. And I'll turn on their pictures too. These were famous sailors from Greek mythology. So this constellation is getting fairly low in the sky, but you can still see it, and just Outside of those stars, you may still notice the red planet Mars right here. Mars was inside of Gemini fairly recently and now has moved beyond it as it moves through its own orbit around the sun and it's steadily moving towards the east in our star field. But all of these objects are also collectively setting and getting lower in the west as we move around the sun. And so you can still see these objects near each other, but right now we can start to say farewell to Gemini. While we're seeing the last of the winter stars set in the west, if you look towards the east, once darkness hits, then you're really starting to see summertime objects, especially two bright stars that you may have already noticed in this area of the sky, all the way from the northeastern to the southeastern portion of our horizon. And one star I already talked about a couple episodes ago that is steadily rising even higher is a star called Vega that we find here. Vega is the fifth brightest star in our night sky. It really shines. And one that is very close to us, relatively speaking, about 25 light years away. So it's one of our neighbors making it such a brilliant and well-studied star in our sky. And so that's a good one to take note of in the Northeast. And Vega is part of the tiny little constellation known as Lyra the Harp. And in our next episode, we'll get into the mythology and talk about the origins behind this small constellation. And it's one of the corner stars and constellations of what's called the Summer Triangle, which we'll mention later in the year. Now, going back to the southeastern portion of our sky as we move to this area, now we're really getting a chance to see this really nice reddish looking star, the one we have right here called Antares. And this is a really interesting star, very big and actually far away, about 550 light years away. So its brightness is not due to it being close to us. Instead, it's just so massive and its surface area is so big, it makes it very, very bright. And also in our next episode, we'll talk more about the science behind this star and the constellation that it's part of. We'll get a chance to also mention the mythology behind Scorpius the Scorpion, a very prominent summer constellation. It looks like an S that's rising out of the southeastern portion of our sky. If you stay up a little bit later at this time of the year, you can see it there. And we'll talk more about that again in our next episode. So you can look forward to some of these bright summer stars really shining, rising out of the eastern side of the sky. And it really reminds you that summertime is right around the corner. On June 10th, a really exciting celestial event occurs when the Earth, Moon, and Sun line up in a nearly perfect straight line, which is called a syzygy. And in this case, the Moon is between the Earth and the Sun, and that's when the Moon is in its new phase. The backside Moon is being lit by the Sun, and when the Moon is new and things are lined up nicely with the Earth and the Sun as well, we get a solar eclipse. 
And in this case, it's called an annular solar eclipse because the moon is not covering the sun completely like a total solar eclipse. And the reason why is the moon's orbit around the Earth is not perfectly circular. And since it's not perfectly circular, that means the moon sometimes is farther from the Earth or closer. And if it's closer to us when a solar eclipse is occurring, then you can have a total eclipse. And the way it works out very nicely in our solar system is that the sun is 400 times larger than the moon, but the moon is 400 times closer to us than the sun is. And since things work out so nicely there, the moon can cover up the sun. But if the moon is farther from us in its orbit during the solar eclipse, that ratio doesn't really remain anymore and the moon does not cover up the sun completely, leaving a ring, an annulus, around the moon. And annular stems from the Latin word annulus, which does mean ring, which we'll see in just a moment. So I have our location set to a northern location in Canada, about 60 degrees north latitude, because this particular eclipse is moving very far northward, kind of near the North Pole. So you gotta be in this very thin slice of the Earth, in extreme northern latitude. So we have it set to one of those locations. And keep in mind, this is very far north. And at this time of year, near the summer solstice, there's a lot of daylight, quite a bit of it. And so even at 3.55 a.m. local time that you see at the bottom here, the sun has already risen, which is really interesting. So the main parts of the eclipse local time for this area really begins at about 4 a.m. So we're gonna move through time here. I'll zoom in to show this eclipse even better. We'll even focus right on this so we can just keep our eyes on this area. We're gonna speed up time now. And as we do, you're gonna see the moon slide over the sun. Now keep in mind as we're watching this, you have to have eye protection the entire time this occurs, especially for an annular eclipse because the moon never completely covers the sun. So you may need approved solar glasses or a solar filter on a telescope, or other safety equipment that allows you to view this without damaging your eyes, so keep that in mind. So as the curse through the morning, you can see the moon covering up the sun more and more, and eventually, at the right time, and for this location, around the 5 a.m. time frame, you get annularity. And I've stopped it pretty much right there. When we zoom in, you can see the ring around the moon. There's that annulus we had mentioned, and there you have it. So what's really interesting, if you're in this location, on the thin slice called the path of annularity, the environment around you changes dramatically. Now, I had a chance to see the total solar eclipse in the United States back in 2017, which was an amazing experience, and that was my first one. If you ever have a chance to witness something like this, it's mind-boggling. And what you'll notice is that the environment around you gets darker, the temperature starts to cool down a little bit, and the animals around you start to change their behavior. The crickets start chirping randomly, birds stop chirping because they think it's nighttime, and if you look in the night sky, in the right area, especially away from where the sun is, stars start to appear, especially the bright ones, and maybe some planets if there are any out. And so the environment around you changes dramatically. It's wild. Now for an annular eclipse, you don't have as much darkening because the moon is not covering up as much of the sun, but it's still enough to really change what you can see. So that's quite amazing to experience that. And if we kind of zoom out here and now watch it, you'll see it go from kind of a darker environment as the moon continues to move through its orbits. We'll go a little faster and then brighten things up again once the moon really moves away from the sun it moves far enough away from it, then it will look like a normal daytime after that, like nothing ever happened. So it's a pretty amazing sight, especially uh, for these eclipses. Again, you have to look at this safely. Now, why am I talking about this particular solar eclipse when it's in extreme northern latitudes? Well, the partial eclipse that can be seen from a huge part of Earth can be seen in northern United States, much of Canada, and Greenland, and even parts of Europe, uh, Russia, and Asia as well. So let me show you this really nice 3D globe of where this eclipse can be seen from. So this three-dimensional globe provided by a wonderful website called timeanddate.com, which is a great website if you want specifics about times for eclipses, other celestial events, sunrise and sunset. They are a great resource 
for knowing the specifics of various things like that. So I'd highly recommend using that website and the resources they provide. And this is one. They have a three-dimensional globe of Earth and showing the path of this annular solar eclipse for June 10th. And as we move our way up here, it does give us a nice red stripe here of where the path of annularity is. That's the path where the moon covers up most of the sun. You get the ring around the moon, all right, in that path there. And there you can see Canada here and Greenland over much of the Arctic Ocean, even parts of Russia as well, the path there. Now, you see these kind of lighter sort of uh, colors here? That's where you can see a partial solar eclipse. So the moon will just cover up a bit of the sun, but not as much as the path you see here. And if this may be a little confusing here, at the bottom left, there is this sort of scale that kind of tells you with color how much of the sun would be covered. So the lighter the color, the less coverage. As you get more to red here in the left, then you'll see more of an eclipse occur. So as we look around the Earth here, you can see even if you're in the northeastern part of the United States, much of the northern parts of the Midwest here, and a whole bunch of Canada, right around here you have a partial eclipse. And again, you're gonna need some type of special equipment, solar eclipse glasses, a solar filter, something like that, so you can see this safely. And as you move farther away from this area, you can see less and less of the eclipse occur. Now, of course, this is over much of the Atlantic Ocean you see here, but as we move our way around the Earth, you can see even parts of Europe have a partial eclipse here, and even Asia, and of course Russia as well. So sometimes the partial eclipse can really spread across much of the planet, and that path of annularity is over that thin slice, and that's basically the shadow of the moon casting a very, very small path we see here. So they can be quite challenging to you know, get to the right location. But this is a great resource to kind of figure that out, and for other eclipses as well on time.com. So for those who are in the right part of the world, I hope this is a great viewing of this annular solar eclipse for June 10th. And finally, by the end of this week, we have a really nice treat in the west after sunset. Looking back in this area again, we can find the thin crescent moon, which is one of my favorite phases of the moon. I love when it looks like this. And Mars relatively nearby. And so if we zoom into this area right when it's dark after sunset, so don't wait too long because these objects will get very low in the sky, there you can see this conjunction when two or more planetary objects get kind of close to each other. You'll see Mars here, which has dimmed quite a bit lately. So it's not as bright as it was early in the year and especially late last year, but you can still see the little reddish glow of this planet and the moon just above it. For those photographers out there or astrophotographers, this is a great opportunity to have a nice moon and Mars here. And you can expose a little bit more, just a little bit, because the moon is not so bright. And so that may allow you to see Mars just a little bit better. That's a nice advantage there when the moon is not a very large phase. So that's kind of a nice way to end the week. This is on the 13th. This is Sunday evening right after sunset once it's dark so you can really see Mars along with our moon and it's a great way to end the observing week. Hey, that's it for another edition of our Sky Tonight program. Thank you so much for tuning in. We really appreciate your support. And as always, please stop by the Lohman Planetarium here at the Museum of Arts and Sciences. If you want more information about our shows or anything that's going on at the museum, check out our website as well. So thank you, take care, and of course, Happy stargazing.